Um, no doubt many of you have heard the, the metaphor of the hundred monkeys, or, or maybe you're Googling it now if you haven't. It began with a population of monkeys, and a few began washing their food, and then other monkeys in the group observed from them and learned to do the same thing. And it wasn't necessarily something that um, older monkeys taught to younger monkeys. It became cross-generational, and once once the hundredth monkey, monkey, so the anthropologists or biologists said, picked up the technique, then it spread to the whole population. So the metaphor is used to describe the tipping point in a population where new behaviors become mainstream. And um, that's why I chose the phrase today. So I think mobile in our industry is much like this, uh, um, in which you know a few of us began experimenting with mobile and now the entire population, thanks mostly to innovations in smartphones, um, is is changing the way it does business and the smartphones themselves are creating that because of their, the change that they're making and the mode of communicating and connecting with, with others. It's very uh, profound behavioral change to society that's rippling through our industry. So I wanted to close the year with um, our perspective on how mobile changes everything in market research. And um, I will start that by saying that we, we just crossed our own kind of tipping point. We, as Lenny said earlier, I think during uh, Paul's presentation, we might hear some stats from Leslie. We, we frequently report our mobile statistics on the new MR webinars. And in the third quarter of this year, we crossed a major milestone um, in the US with more than half of our traffic being generated by mobile devices. The white paper is available on the website if you want to download it. So I just want to remind our listeners that for us and many in the industry, the mobile tipping point is, is, has arrived and maybe is even well past. I think that we're, we're always a leading indicator, and I'll also caution that our mobile stats drop sometimes from one quarter to another. They don't always trend up, but they mostly trend up. So uh, I invite you to take a look at those. And uh, the truth is that survey traffic from mobile respondents, including our, our own clients and in, including processes we use internally, is growing so rapidly and in such a short time frame that most of us aren't fully prepared for it because that means a rethinking of pretty much every, all our processes, everything we do today. So I, I'm going to focus on what's changing here. And um, the, the, the items are numbered, so if you watch the numbers on the screens, um, you'll see how many things are changing, and I haven't by any means included them all. But I, I think the first thing that I wanted to talk about was apps. Apps certainly aren't new, but they're getting much smarter. Um, re we have research agencies, uh, technology providers, and even you know large end clients, and especially the retailers are developing apps that combine marketing, data collection, and even rolling the small uh, bits of behavioral analysis into single um, real-time tools that are used across an enterprise. And this is the, the vision that we've heard so much about in, uh, I would say, over the last year, year and a half to two years. Retailers are among the most advanced of the app designers, and they're their customers, which of course includes those of us listening today, will be using second generation apps of their favorite re retailers, and no doubt we did on Monday and over the course of the, the big uh, shopping holiday. The apps are now recording factors like the length of time that we spend in, in the store or perhaps potentially a competitor store you know, activity around comparison shopping, whether we're going online while we're um, in the store, and all kinds of meaningful data. And, and it's typically being exchanged and motivated by things like in-store coupons and um, special sales alerts and that type of information. It, does, it may not seem radically new, but the amounts and types of data that are being collect, collected are 
are more extensive, I think, than the research industry envisioned when we first started talking about mobile um, a few years ago. So we have to look at the app market now by almost by type of app and segment it. There's some that are used exclusively for market research data collection, whether it's face-to-face -face or qual or surveys or, or communities, where you're getting active data collection versus those are, that are focusing more on passive data collection that's occurring in the background. And sometimes uh, we have apps that are doing both, with the, the focus now shifting to some more passive forms of data collection. But I think this also sets in place a model in which consumers um, begin to understand the value of the data that they're sharing. And while there's not really any value in a consumer's mind yet about what their information is worth, there is a potential paradigm shift between the researcher and the consumer or respondent in which the consumer may become much more aware uh, than they are today of the value associated with particular types of data. And that brings me to number two, which is incentives. There's, there's been resistance and I think even disinterest in many cases in downloading market research apps, but as consumers, if we see the value of sharing uh, data, um, we may be more inclined to share uh, our information. I think the incentives for participation um, which in, in passive data collection may be um, less direct monetary, more in-store currency and some of even virtual currencies, those kinds of things, um, the, the shift is inevitable. And on a side note, um, these types of incentives often provide instant gratification, which has also been shown to, to stimulate impulse purchases. So I think there, therein lies um, a challenge between what is research and, and what is marketing and sales. There's been a lot of discussion um, in the past year around the quantified self. This is um, that some of the data that's collected by third parties we might consider very valuable to know. So biometrics is an example. Anybody listening in who is a Fitbit buyer um, would relate to this. So in many instances, we may be willing to share information simply in exchange for knowing that bit of information about ourselves. More than that, um, a recent report, The Value of Our Digital Identity by the Boston Consulting Group estimates that the collection and sale of personal data could provide an annual economic benefit of a trillion euros to the EU by 2020. So while we're seeing the changes being profound to our industry, um, it actually is a change that it, it may be profound to the world economy and is considered to be a key driver of economic growth at the moment, not just a driver within our own industry. The number um, four is surveys, and um, while our industry's made Google consumer surveys one of the most talked about topics during uh, the last couple of years, Google has competition in the micro survey arena from a large variety of startups who um, maybe bundle the a, a, a nice um, simple interface and sample into a single search self-serve design and um, many of the things that Paul uh, talked about I would agree with in, in that companies are rolling out solutions that focus on the respondent for instance limiting the number of questions that a respondent could be asked or perhaps randomly presenting a, a subset of questions in a larger um, survey to one respondent and um, another subset to a different respondent, perhaps one that has similar demographic or behavioral characteristics. So that you're not necessarily matching up respondents across the entire data set is what I'm saying. Um, and a lot of uh, tools that are simple and easy to use and geared to a specific vertical as opposed to focusing upon a broader solution set. So um, I think that it remains to be seen um, if 
some of these companies can compete with Google, but there's no doubt that there is broad interest in the microsurvey business model, and I would see microsurveys as being as collecting much more data than lengthier surveys in the future. Um, the new trend is to uh, price surveys by the questions with panelists bundled in, and um, we suspect that micropayments for add-ons like uploading photos and things like that may follow, so we may start to see very um, micro pricing elements and different types of, uh, of pricing models in our industry. But regardless, the pricing models in our industry will, will um, be revamped as, as we progress. The fifth item on my list is the respondent experience. Um, what microsurveys do is ensure that mobile and other survey takers are presented short, salient surveys. The control is out of the researcher's hands with some of the newer tools, which ensures that the respondent experience is, is protected um, above the interests of the of the researcher. Right. So Paul addressed this. Very important moving forward. Number six is outsourcing. We all know that there will be no need to outsource short surveys, mobile surveys. Not only will many companies who do not already, you know, do their own programming, do their own programming, but many who have previously outsourced programming We'll see no need to do so in the future. So the role of the large outsourcing companies is shifting um, with a need to develop expertise in modeling large data sets and um, get into new areas like social media, um, monitoring and analytics, and, and uh, become experts in secondary monetization of data assets. As the seventh item I have, um, survey writing, routing. Many of the behind the scenes processes are also being revamped. In September of this year, Federated Sample announced mobile routing as an augment to its platform and there may be other companies doing the same thing. So for those of you who are not familiar with survey routing, it basically entails directing a respondent or panelist from one survey to another. It might be done, for instance, if um, um, it, it might be done, for instance, if they don't qualify for the first uh, project, and you're, you you want to send them in to something that would allow them to take a second chance. So, what's happening here is that respondents can now be routed based upon the device they're using, so that you ensure that they're going to a survey that is mobile friendly and ready for them, and beyond that, short, um, and that they're already qualified to take. So it may be one way to overcome the issue of sending respondents into lengthy surveys, um, as there's, a, uh, there's going to continue to be an interest and need for lengthy sur surveys for the foreseeable future. And um, as our own data shown, the dropout rate is much higher on mobile devices, and it's unfortunately steadily increasing. It's also in the, in the white paper. It's, it's actually fairly disturbing data. So the mobile router provides a, another quality check for these kinds of scenarios, and it's just an example of a behind-the-scenes process that's being reshaped um, by the mobile landscape. So um, number eight is panels, and I think most people today think that in the future the majority of online panels are, are going to disappear, and, and definitely we see consolidation, especially in the access panel area, but we're also seeing a lot of revitalization and diversification of the goals and objectives of panels on the enterprise side. Um, they're, um, changing their content a bit and being repurposed and becoming more of a full-service research hub. So um, we see many companies developing uh, mobile-only approaches using um, perhaps an app, perhaps a browser-based approach, perhaps both for the purpose of engaging respondents on their mobile devices with more of a focus on the point of purchase to uh, you know, where decisions are made. 
and of course many traditional panel companies augmenting with application with with apps that can be used to supplement um, the 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 panelist data set perhaps with data that's passively gathered that adds in uh, a qualitative or a um, geoloco component and those sorts of things. So th those are very obvious. They're happening now in both the consumer online panels like Research Now and Toluna, but they're also happening in the enterprise. Um, the enterprise customer panel is taking on a, a bigger role and it's, it's a hub that's going beyond the traditional customer satisfaction and product planning, which is how a lot of them evolved, to um, to include a lot of types of data that are com combined with it to pro provide the behavioral and attitudinal segmentations. And again, a lot of those will come from a mobile app. A lot of that data is coming from mobile apps. The ninth thing on our list of things that's changing is methodologies. The last presentation, you know, was a, an ex one example. Um, if we talk about some of the methodologies that have been long-standing in, in MR, one, I, one concept that came to me immediately was the omnibus. With the advent of microsurveys, it's really doubtful that the cost advantages of the online omnibus will continue. And it's really just a small example of the change in mobile, it's, it's turned um, uh, some uh, methodologies like mystery, sh mystery shopping and, and diaries on their head uh, and there are m more full-fledged multimedia experiences now. Um, we still see conjoins, max diffs, and complex exercises, um, but they're being used a lot more cautiously, I think, than they used to be. So to pick just one small topic, there's uh, been a lot of discussion about the use of the net, <coughs> excuse me, the net promoter score on mobile devices. And um, I'm, I think most of our listeners know, but net promoter is essentially an 11-point scale that serves as a measure of loyalty. And it really offers too many um, points to easily display on a, a smartphone. And the variation of the display uh, creates a bias in results. And um, so this is just one example where there's a, a, a very large contingent using something that's sort of broken and um, the industry needs to come to consensus on it. And that, of course, leads to number 10, benchmarks, which we're also going to have to be reestablished. The eleventh item is uh, respondent on authentication, and um, this this particularly impacts anyone doing cross-platform measurement. Um, obviously, there's a need in ad effectiveness and and many other um, instances to track the respondent on multiple devices. Um, we've we've kind of watch and monitor here how many people drop out on one device and attempt to take it on another or participate across devices. Um, there's a lot written on this topic. You may want to check out a recent blog post that we wrote on the use of cookies, but basically a comprehensive solution that, that solves all of the uh, respondent authentication across devices is not really imminent in the short term. It's a longer term problem. Uh, next up is social media, and it's mobile so heavily intertwined with social media as to be, I think, almost virtually inseparable. The mobile user is the social media user. Um, some recent stats, 65% <coughs> of um, Facebook's mobile users access it now on mobile devices, so they're well past their tipping point. And that's a 51% increase over last year. Uh, mobile users are engaging with Facebook 20 billion minutes a month. 60% of Twitter's followers do the same. And even LinkedIn, which is a B2B site that you know you would say is more typically used in the office, is, is already at 38% mobile users um, expecting to exceed 50% next year. But when you look at the reverse, 71% um, of people 
with mobile access also access um, social media. So it, they are very heavily intertwined. And most importantly, mobile users tend to spend more time engaging with social media than do non-mobile users of social media. So we see the impact of this trend very, very heavily when people um, uh, launch their projects via social media. It's, it's heavily um, uh, mobile traffic at that point in time, often exceeding um, 50 or 60 percent. So uh, this is another thing that carefully needs to be watched and planned as, uh, as you uh, slide into social media. The next item up is privacy and security. And in the, in the spirit of giving um, customers and respondents greater control and encouraging trust, the privacy policies are really um, undergoing some change too. <coughs> um, regardless of how this evolves, and it, 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 there's a lot of talk of giving users control over, you know, in a Facebook type style of which types of data they're willing to share, almost on a discrete data by d data uh, item. Um, our industry's hosting new types of data much of it's highly sensitive. It's more sensitive than ever before. Some of it we don't know how it might be used. Um, and that requires ever greater security and diligence and protection. And that just means a clamp down in our organizations. It's uh, an unfortunate but necessary byproduct. And I think all the market research uh, firms in the future will have high level security certifications if they don't today. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about the era of trust between collectors of data, you know, which includes everything from financial institutions, internet providers, retailers, of course, our industry, governments, many types of organizations, and it's it's going to be interesting to see if and how trust can be established and whether we're we're capable of main, maintaining um, that. Next up, and um, really the last item on my list, is uh, automation. And I think this is perhaps the biggest change of all. When things become shorter and, and simpler, um, we're not necessarily collecting less data. We uh, are commoditizing and making things uh, and perhaps collecting more. Many of the changes that I've described are going to cause us to automate the market research process from collection through reporting. I mean, that's what real-time analytics uh, is about. And you can only achieve it if, if uh, automation does occur. And while we're, we'll always need analysts to sift through the reservoirs of data to determ determine what's meaningful or to determine what should be collected in order to refine the, the decision-making models that we put in place, I think a lot of the typical processes that we think of as project management, which is things like, you know, uh, from a panel perspective, developing sampling frameworks and setting up projects and fielding in, in, the, in the traditional way we've done it, um, are, are going to, uh, to go in uh, another direction. And when we start collecting data in a variety of places in small bits and snippets, the role of a market researcher is very much very much altered. So um, just to enclose, the smartphone is getting smarter. It's going to dominate our industry if it isn't uh, already now. And uh, there's the, the last monkey who didn't get it. <laughs>